You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. So we're talking about life going through the waters. What does that mean? Uh, Phil unpacked it with excellence last week, helping us see the Red Sea narrative and what it meant to go through the waters for the people of God. And today we talk about going through the water and the echoes. When we talk about echoes, one of the things that really stands out is an echo is something that reminds us of what happened before and what will happen again. When something happens and we kind of have this deja vu moment where it triggers a memory and we're like, oh yeah, yeah, that happened before. I know, I know we all have echoes in our lives. Um, I've told you this before, but my youngest son, Ethan, the kid loves water. I mean, he will swim any chance he gets. He just loves the water. And I'll never forget, I, um, I loved water too. I mean, I grew up swimming and doing stuff, but um, I learned when I was up north with my wife, uh, there's a family cottage that uh, is owned by some siblings and we, we go up to there and it's the greatest place on earth in my mind. It's this deep, clear, spring-fed lake. And um, my wife would go up there as a child and I'll never forget when I went up there and, um, and I realized that Ethan got his love for swimming from his mom. Not for me. I was a little jealous and a little bitter because I watched her and I watched her play in the water, right? And, and for me, I grew up playing on the water. You give me a surfboard, a boogie board, a bridge to jump off, a cliff to jump off, a swing to swing off, a boat to pull me, drag me and get me waterlogged. I loved playing on the water, but I don't remember just playing in the water. My grandparents had a pool. We always got busted for putting the trampoline next to it and stuff like that. I was always, you know, I was always adding something to it. But my wife just played in the water. I've watched her do this um, so many times because uh, I was at the cottage with Erica and our kids and, um, and she just makes up games and then we're forced to play them. Anybody else have a family member like that? Who's like, I came up with a game and you're like, Boo. Because you know, like three hours is, yeah, you're about to play a game. One of the favorite games is called, um, is called Save the Earth. You know the kids ever play a game like this? Take a golf ball, you're out on the raft, you throw the golf ball out, out and you count to two or three, and then some poor soul has to dive in, swim down, and catch the golf ball before it hits the sediment and goes, boof, and the earth begins to implode. Anybody else? <laughs> No? You're like 18 feet underwater. You save the earth and you're like, yeah. And then you realize you're out of air. And you sound like you're at like a Bedouin um, Yeti race on the way back. Like you're just trying to get back to the surface. And you're just dying to get up here to save the world. I almost died. That's what I play. That is what the cottage is like for me. Erica loves to swim. Just play in the water. And what, um, what makes me happy is amid all the activity, I mean, she even makes us swim across it. And I, I, I say this and she knows it. She'd be like, do you want to swim across the lake? No, no. I know I float better than her, but no. You know, I'm like, this is, I, and then the next thing I know, I'm like, this is great. You know, it's super long and I'm just bobbing in a lake and trying to keep up with the kayak, fearing death. And she's just having a blast, loves the water. And then there's times where she falls really strangely quiet which for Erica is rare. She's just not a sit down kind of person. And I'll watch her and I know she's listening to the echoes. She grew up at that cottage playing with her brothers. She has amazing memories of Jeff and Josh and Andrew and playing with them and with cousins and having so much fun. And she's watching her kids make the same games and noises and things she did as a little girl. There's an echo going on and it reminds her of what was It celebrates what is and it gives a hope that one day our kids will bring theirs to that place and the splashing and the giggling and the swimming will be the same. Sometimes God walks us through water. He walks us through a circumstance or something that is an echo of the past and he does so to reassure us, to remind us who he is even still and who we belong to no matter what. Sometimes God gives us an echo And today, we're going to spend some time in Joshua chapter 3. We're going to lean into the echo of what goes on in that chapter. It says this, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. 
When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. And then you will know which way to go because you've never been this way before. Think about that. Think about it with me. Anybody here ever get sent back, in, back when your parents would hand you a $5 bill and say, hey, run to the corner store, milk, eggs, and I don't know, toilet paper. Sorry, uh, butter. Let's go with butter. That's better, right? <laughs> God, why? To- oh, man, ruined it. All right, so milk, eggs, and butter. And, and kids are like, whoa, you can buy all that with $5? Yeah, when you're my age, you could have. When you got sent to the store and you get a slushy, but not now. Um, <laughs> So you get on your bike and you take off $5 deep in the pocket of your jeans, you know, that were too short, you always grow them, and you're pedaling off and you get about a third of the way there and you're like, well, I've always trust my dad and mom for navigation. I don't really know where I am. Anybody ever get lost going to the corner store? You know, only to be found by a cop going, what's wrong? You're like, yeah, oh, yeah. And you're super lost because you're terrified and they're like, okay, you're a block and a half from home, right? And your mom says, okay, next time they send you, they're like, okay, you go up here. You turn right on Lincoln, you go upstate to West Side One Stop. Don't cross unless there's the green man. Yes, mom. And there you go, right? They give you directions. That's what God's doing. He doesn't send them out to get lost. He gives them directions like a parent. I love the generous, kind spirit of God in this. He says to them, you are to move out from your positions and follow the Levitical priests. Then following them, you will know which way to go. Since you've never been there before, he doesn't say, I expect you to figure it out on your own. He sends them with the priests in front. They're being led and guided, but keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass on ahead of the people. So they took up the Ark and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they will know that I am with you as I was with Moses. I think this is important. I think we need to maybe just pause for a second and understand the purpose of this exaltation why God would say to Joshua, I'm going to exalt you in the eyes of these people. I'm going to show them that you are just like Moses. And here's what we have to understand. Leaders come and go. Pastors come and go. Priests come and go. But who stays the same yesterday, today, and forever? Please don't hitch your wagon to Eric Folker's hitch it to Jesus Christ. Tie yourself on to the one who never changes. Leaders come and go, but God remains the same. But he still exalted Joshua to do one thing, to remind the people that God was with them. It wasn't magic Moses who was great. God was still God, even if it was Joshua. And he would continue to be God with all the leaders who would follow him. And it was repeated past the crossing. See, they had known about a crossing. And I think it's important that we, that we remind ourselves that these men and women of Israel were 40 years past the crossing of the Red Sea and that generation had died off. The people in Israel at this point had not been part of those who walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. They had never seen this before. And what we see in this and understand in this is that God is with Joshua the way he is with Moses. And Moses and Joshua aren't the point. God is. God is. He's faithful. And what it does is this echoes back to God's faithfulness 40 years ago, but they had only heard of it back then. They were about to experience here and now. It makes me think of Foundry West, who is currently, they just got out of church. They just got out of church out at Benjamin's Hope. And they are doing things that would make perfect sense to me. We're about three years old as a church. We became an official planted church in 2000. Oh, I don't do math publicly, but three years ago this December. All right. That's just, I'll forgive the dyslexic for trying. Um, But but three years ago, we became an official church and we were scrapping to make it. 
Like, remember Justin, like, looking out the window going, is anybody going to come? Like, cars would drive by. I was like, turn them around, God. Like, you know, I, I just, it was terrifying. You put out a full pot of coffee and pray that someone would, you know, like, it'd be lower. Please have someone come. You'd put out your, your, your hospitality and do stuff. And you, and you feel, well, it's the rhythms of trying to make it, of trying to survive, and they're feeling it. They are living in the echoes of what we did three years ago and are doing even now. I'm excited and a little bit jealous of them because in your tension and your anxiety, you stare out windows and go, oh, was this a bad idea? No, I think we followed God. And you go into the waters. It echoes. Do you hear the echo? If you remember what we did in the early days, there was so much joy in the labor, in the trying, in the engagement, and in the uncertainty. There's nothing you could do to pull it off. You just had to trust that God was leading. Verse 9, it says, Joshua said to the Israelites, come here, listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. See, the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, it will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. I love that scripture. I love that because it tells me one thing. Leadership matters. We as Christians have to follow the lordship of Jesus Christ as he leads his church. It's not just my job. But we follow faithfully the word of the Lord in our lives. A leader communicates the word of God and then confidently leads people out into it. It takes that courageous obedience to step out into the unknown I grew up out west where the rivers melt off, the mountains, the snow in the mountains melt off in Colorado and California. And down into the valleys come rushing ice cold glacial waters that fill our rivers to overflowing. I know what a river in flood stage looks like. I know the damage it can do. And I still stand amazed that God would send the most prized possession of Hebrew worship, the Ark of the Covenant, into the waters first, unless it was telling us that God goes before us in everything we do, that God is out ahead of us. If you read devotions this past week, you would understand, Derek wrote, that this journey across the Jordan wasn't actually geographically necessary. I want to help every child who goes on spring break this year about the drive you're going to go on, okay? I want to help you have a little perspective. The Hebrews were supposed to travel one month from Egypt into the promised land. If you walked it, it's a month. They took a 39-year and 11-month detour. So give your parents some slack if they stop in Macon, Georgia, right? Because it's not that bad. A 39-year and one-month detour into the wilderness the distance of a month's travel took 40 years. And now God was doing something that would echo once again. He's sending them on an unnecessary route. And part of you wonders if they were like, oh, here we go again. Why again? But I believe it was because God was teaching them something. Because God was reminding them of who he is and who they were. And he was going to instill in them a dependence that doesn't just live in your head, but it moves to your heart and affects the way you move. A dependence on God where you look and you know, without him, there's no way that happened. And they would have a dependence and an understanding, a dependence on God and an understanding of him as Lord, well, as it said three times, Lord of all the earth. God's sovereign over everything. Verse 14 says, so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. We're gonna keep playing on this for a minute. I don't know if you've ever stood um, in a river that's really moving, like really moving, but rivers at flood stage flow with volume and with great speed great haste. And when you put your foot into the river, you can be ankle deep, it'll erode the 
the silt out from under your feet and off you go. It was a risky move for Joshua and the Ark of the Covenant to lead the way. He had everything to lose. Joshua did. But notice, Joshua preceded the procession. He went first. He didn't back away from leading at flood stage. He knows that God is going to use the water in a way that will cause a miracle in their own eyes. They'll see God at work in their own life. It will show his power. And so I want to say something for you and for me to take confidence together. I believe in failing forward, making mistakes in an effort to obey God. Because what the world sees as failure, sometimes God sees as a wild success that you obeyed courageously. And for us, when you are called to lead, don't doubt what God has shown you. Don't blink and balk and pull back, but step into it. You are trusting in God, not in yourself, not in people you're leading. And you are understanding that it is him alone who will make it work. Because if you've ever stepped in one of those wild, fast moving rivers, you can do all you want, but there is no stopping it. You can yell at it. King Xerxes, when he lost a war to the Greeks, he got so mad that he ordered his, um, his torturers to go out and give the river 50 lashes. <laughs> Xerxes, right? You see him out there, he's like, Whoosh, I feel so stupid, Whoosh, you know? And he's like, why? Because that river was undoing his military plans. You can do all you want, but in the end, when you're standing foot first into a river that's moving deep, fast, and cold, well, God is the only one that's gonna make this crossing work. And I know you and I have walked down that road where we step out into something and we know if God doesn't get involved very quickly, something's gonna go wrong. Only God can make it work. Scripture goes on to say, yet as soon as the priests who carry the ark reach the Jordan and their feet touch the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing and it piled up in a heap a great distance in a way at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon, where the water flowing down to the Sea of um, Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, and remember that name too, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over across from Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. You wanna have, let's, let's just have some fun real quick. Where did the waters pile up in a heap? Anybody remember? Oh, I was going to say, wow, mute. Awesome. All right, so Adam, right? Adam. Where were they flowing? To the Dead Sea. Adam in Hebrew means life. The Dead Sea is, well, it, its name says it. Think of what God just did. Think of what God's doing in this. From Adam to the Dead Sea, the river was flowing and no man could stop it. Nobody could keep its waters from doing what it wished. No one could prevent the flow from life unto death until God did what? This is where it gets really fun. God did what? He piled the waters up at life and he ceased the flow unto death. And who preceded that event? But his leader, Joshua. We know Jesus by his name in Greek, Jesus. But do you know what his name is in Hebrew? Yeshua, Joshua. There is a big like bong of an echo right there. What is God saying? He is saying to his people that I am stopping the endless flow from life, birth unto death, but I am gonna interrupt that flow. I am gonna stop the flow from life unto death. And I'm gonna let my people pass through. I believe this is a messianic foreshadowing where Jesus Christ would do the very work that Joshua did, but he would do it in the spiritual realm where you and I would have our lives, well, piled up in a heap. We wouldn't be in an endless flow from life unto death. We would be interrupted and we would be led from life into life everlasting because Yeshua stepped foot in the river. He led us through the waters. And in his baptism, in his, the baptism into his death, we are raised into his life. It's why I love infant baptism and baptism of any age. When you are baptized, the flow from life unto death ceases. 
because Jesus Christ took you through the waters, because you were kept in the hands of him who is Lord over all the earth. And if he chooses to pile the waters up and lead you through, he will. The question is, will you follow? It doesn't mean it's guaranteed. It doesn't mean it's easy. But God cut away through the waters. First through his servant, Joshua. And over a thousand years later, through his son, Jesus, he led the way. You know, I think since the fall of man, I mean, who was the first man? Adam. Who fell first? Adam. And from Adam to the very end of time, it looked like it would be Adam and all of humanity unto death until Christ crossed the waters, until Christ stopped the flow. And for you and I, we know we're called to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that in his death, We are called into his resurrection. And in his resurrection, the flow unto death has utterly stopped. And the call unto life eternal has not only rung clear in our hearts, but it's been answered. And we live not in spite of our circumstances. We live by the power of God through our circumstances. Difficult days are made purposeful because Christ stopped the flow unto death. And we as the church live in that hope. We pass through by the power of his son. So let me ask you, and I want you to think with me. I'm going to give you a second to think about it. Where did God pile the waters up in a heap for you? Where was it that Jesus took you through the waters? Where you were beyond what you could control and life just was having its way and God piled up the waters and called you through them to himself. Where was it for you when God interrupted your fast track from life unto death? Remember that day? I can't forget mine. It was an August night in Colorado. The Lord called my name. It was awesome. It was terrifying. I wasn't going to go down front. That was crazy. That was for the Pentecostals. I'll raise my hand. I didn't know I was reformed then, but turns out I was. I was like, oh, I'll just receive you here, right? But I'll never forget raising my hand and saying, I need you. I love you. I don't know um, why I've walked away, but help me. I was lost. And he called me. I'll never forget the life that began that day, that moment. It was a turning point in my life. And from obedience to obedience, from putting my toes in various puddles that he called me through to the wild raging river of trying to start a church, it has been nothing but following God. And it's been an adventure that changed my entire existence. What about us? What about you? Where did God meet you? Where did the waters pile up? so that you could cross over and life eternal could begin. We can't forget that we all begin in the same place at a river that flowed from life unto death that we couldn't stop except there was one who could stop it. And when he called our name, his irresistible grace called us home to him and he piled life up so that we would recognize our need for him. Remember that place. Remember where he rescued you. Let's quit pretending that we've always just had it together. Because we all know that's a super duper farce. Nobody's got it together. I mean, I would love to just do an honest inventory of who feels like they've got a little bit of a personal garbage fire going in their own life. Nobody'd be like, oh, it's small, but it's really going a lot of black smoke, (laughs) right? Nobody wants to admit it, but we've all got issues. Thanks be to God that our baptismal vows say this, I will never leave you, I will never let you go. He promises to hold on to us when we let go. He promises to be bigger than the storms of our life. And he'll walk us through them and speak, peace be still. For you and I, we live in the call to remember the place we were first redeemed, where we crossed over and life to death became life unto life eternal. So that our life took on meaning and purpose within this world, not above it and beyond it. We're called into this world. Where were you when God rescued you? Where were you when Jesus called your name? Crossed a different path you couldn't have seen because it was below the raging waters of this life. And yet he led you, led you straight through it unto life eternal. I encourage you today. You're gonna go eat with friends, family, different things. I would love it if you would just tell your story to your friends and family today. Just tell them, hey, this is where I met Jesus. I don't remember too much about it, but I remember this. 
and just tell them. I think our testimony matters. I think it's important that our children and our grandchildren, that our brothers, our sisters, our aunts, our uncles, our parents, our grandparents, our friends, our neighbors hear our testimony and know that we didn't wake up reformed and having it together. We woke up in the middle of our own garbage fire and needed God to cut a path through. And he did by the blood of Jesus Christ. Make no mistake, when Joshua stood in the river the first time, it was a foreshadowing of what Christ would do on your behalf. The question is now for us, how do we live in so great a grace, in so high a calling? It will not be easy, but you are called into this transformation. We're stepping into the waters, you realize that the God of the universe for some reason loves us and called us not to be our best selves, but to be made into his image by the power of his Holy Spirit. So my prayer and my hope today is that we will remember our stories and then we will begin to take the next faithful steps as God continues leading us through the waters and we slowly disappear while he transforms us into his image. Pray with me. Lord Jesus. As your church, we just recognize that our lives are often lived in pursuit of things, in the want of more, and in the sense of the safe and secure. So today, Lord Jesus Christ, we just confess that maybe we haven't been fully alive in you, Christ Jesus. Even remembering the echoes of our own salvation, remembering the echoes of our family's faithful story, remembering the echoes that you, God, through Joshua, held up the waters. And then you, God, through Yeshua, held up the waters. And the flow from life unto death was, was interrupted. Thank you, God, for that divine interruption. Thank you that our lives have purpose. Help us to remember and catch the echoes. To catch the echoes, God, so we remember what you've done, but we also remember that you're calling us into something new. May we be faithful to step into the rivers, the wild, untamed life of a Christian full of the Holy Spirit and called according to the purposes of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we live fully in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, would you join me by standing and singing? Look, I'll be the first to tell you, it is, um, it is altogether unnerving to step into the waters, right? But let's be honest, nothing really fun happens on the bank. You know, and we've got so many Christians, if I'm honest, who just kind of want to be like, how do I just get into heaven? It's not part of it. It's not just like, oh, how do I, how do I just, you know, cash in and get, in, get into heaven easy? It's about becoming the very person of Christ in this life. And the only way to do it is through the waters, through a courageous step into the identity of Christ. Our baptism seals us into his death so that we can be in his life. So I invite you, remember the echoes of when God first found you. And if for you in this room today, the first note ever is playing, you're like, oh, I need Jesus, come see me. I would super love to pray with you. I would love to introduce you to the one I call Lord and Savior. Because I will tell you this, in our faith, it takes courage to follow faithfully because we don't have guaranteed outcomes. We don't have guaranteed outcomes, but we have this promise that the character of God, you can trust. God has shown himself faithful time and again. It's us who often drop the ball. So this week, walk with him. Follow him into the things that scare you the most and see what kind of life he brings out of it. And if you would like to begin your journey of faith, I invite you again don't be like cowardly me in 1994. Come on down front. Don't just raise your hand. Come on down front. Let's pray together and let's begin a life that will echo into eternity the faithful grace of Jesus Christ. As you go about it, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building. My friends, you're dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.